we're pitching a new show. It's called Dinner with a Dictator. Hello and welcome to the Bulwark's Next Level Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Miller. We've got a great guest this Sunday. It is Andrew Zimmer, and you might know him from Wild Game Kitchen, premiering uh, this season, rather, it's premiering on the Outdoor Channel here in a couple weeks, September 23rd. He's got a sub stack. He's got a website. He was the creator of Bizarre Foods. Uh, he had a show on MSNBC even. I haven't gotten a show on MSNBC yet. It was called What's Eating America. He's a World Food Program Ambassador. He's a street walker in Minneapolis. Anything else you want me to, no, to shout I'm out? No, but I'm proudest of the last one, especially at my age, that I have a viable career there is just quite a – it says a lot about me. Well, you know, everybody's got a type. Um, yep. It is so good uh, to have you. Uh, we've met only once before. It was very. It was kind of a, a weird. Was it? A, was it the COVID Bill Maher, or was it? A, was it was it a, the last episode of the of the Mar show before they shut it down for COVID. That's right. And because we were, we were, they were scared. You know, people had masks. They had every other seat in the audience. It was like a weird. It was weird. The whole thing was weird, but it was it was actually one of. Uh, it was a great episode of the show. Uh, and very memorable for me because I got to meet a lot of people that I had uh, had long wanted to, uh, you among them. And uh, yeah, that's why we're here. That's nice. Today. And uh, my my big memory from that is after the show aired, I received a text from my old boss, Reince Priebus, who said he was a big fan of yours. And I'm <laughs> sure the feeling is mutual. It, it's it, it, you know what's really this, but this kind of proves the 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 larger piece of my zeitgeist which is that you know food really connects everyone we all do it i've never left a meal with someone where i haven't liked them less and 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 it it's i mean that includes you know dictators terrorists um i mean real ones i mean overseas i've had a chance to meet suck ups to chief of staff suck ups to uh, want to be autocrats no that's right what? and and or or in fact autocrats and and at, at one point we had piled up the autocrats so much with these no cameras allowed but you know when when you're in nicaragua and you're the only food sh american show uh as popular as bizarre foods was during the day that's ever shot in nicaragua uh, you know, Ortega wanted to to meet and share a meal, and they got me to throw out the first pitch at the um, at the Nicaraguan World Series. We were down there for that, so I mean, do you have a good arm? Crumbling, good enough. I went into this crumbling stadium, you know, and the place is going wild because my show airs down there. They knew who I was, um, and it was on that trip that one of my producers said to me, "We're pitching a new show. It's called Dinner with a Dictator." And it's you talking about the stuff that you really want to talk about that we can't talk about when we're making bizarre foods, which is, you know, so tell me, exterminating half your citizenship to gain power. How's that feel? You know, I mean, it's, you know, so that didn't come up. All the starving okay. people didn't come up. None of that. We you learn very uh, early in these dinners that um, you can subtly bring things. And if something is brought up, you can ask a question. But it's bad when you're helicoptered to the mountaintop and you have no way to leave uh, to start asking questions that are way too personal. Yeah, this is why I don't get invited to a lot of dinners. Um, I'm finding out. Uh, one thing that uh, uh, so we're going to get into all this food policy stuff. Uh, there's so much, you know, climate, Ukraine, immigrant, et cetera. Um, I want to ask you some some cooking questions, which I know I'm sure you love. Uh, but uh, first, like one of the big themes of this show has been, uh, you know, people who, like me, made some maybe some smart changes in midlife and uh, some life-affirming midlife changes uh, that have been good for them. And, and so maybe sharing that gives some, you know, maybe a buck up or some wisdom to other people who are trying to, to, to make changes in their life. So you've managed to do that twice, for people who don't know. First, you were struggling with addiction, maybe an understatement, and then moved into the restaurant biz, and then you left the restaurant biz and went into journalism. So like for folks who don't know you that well, maybe do a short sketch of, of, of how that happened and like some, some lessons that you took from, from those changes. Uh, child of privilege, New York City, uh, right schools, right connections, right everything, developed a horrific drug and alcohol problem, uh, managed it for a while, 
um, until it began to manage me. It was probably managing me long before I realized it. Um, and uh, I became a, a homeless street person, uh, a user of people and a taker. Literally of homeless. Literally homeless. I was living in an abandoned building on House, uh, on Sullivan Street, just south of Houston, um, a block that now is very, very fancy, right around the corner from Emilio's Bellotto. Uh And uh, I, I think the abandoned building that we were squatting at the time uh, for a year, I didn't shower. I did. I stole every day if I needed food or or alcohol. I, I stole jars of Comet cleanser and Ajax to sprinkle around the pile of dirty clothes and broken pieces of pillows and mattresses that I called a bed uh, every night so that the rodents and rats and roaches wouldn't crawl over me. Um, it, it was the most horrible, awful <clears throat> moment of my life, but I tolerated that for almost a year until I decided to steal a bunch of uh, jewelry from my godmother and- um, Did they know who you, where you were, people, your, people in your life? Did they know uh, who you were? I had, long, I had long since burned all those bridges. Got it. Um, it was, uh, it, it, and it was that realization, interestingly enough, that made me decide to take this jewelry. I went, I uh, bought a couple nights in a flea bag hotel uh, called the San Pedro that doesn't exist. Uh, bought a case of Papa vodka that had just that week uh, come to the U.S. market, and it was in plastic liter bottles. Mm, I remember and, the bottle. Uh, so I went to lift it and kind of using my knees, and the guy said, looked at me and went, plastic bottles? And I was like, oh, my God. Like, it was a huge – so I remember that very, very vividly. And I tried to drink myself to death and ate a lot of pills, and uh, I should have been dead. I mean, medically, I should be dead. And I woke up, uh, we believe, because we only have pieces to put this together from my friend's memories. It was about 48, 56 hours later, I came to in this hotel room and I wasn't dead. And I plugged the phone back into the wall and asked a friend for help. And uh, it was the first time in my life I said, I don't know what to do, I need help. And I'd never used those words before. And when I say never, I'm not exaggerating. It's not a, a, a cute dinner party story. I mean, I had never, I was so self-centered, so egotistical, so narcissistic that I never would admit to not knowing something. I'd rather make it up and have you know I was lying than ever say, oh no, I don't know what that is. Tell me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wound up three days after that phone call at Hazelden. That was January 28th, 1992. And I've been continuously sober ever since. And um, about five, six years into sobriety, I realized that at, at the very heart of my talent wheel, I was a storyteller and that I was doing it with food. And uh, I wanted a bigger audience. I thought that... Um, I thought that people were uh, becoming dangerously. This, by the so way, just backing up a second. So you, so you become sober, and then you got, and then that's when you get into re the restaurant business. Well, I've been in restaurants my whole life. Oh, right, that's right. You were doing restaurants here, and, and, and then so, it was in Minnesota. You, was where you yeah, opened. Yeah, I got a. Like. I mean, kind of a funny story. I was living in a halfway house. Okay. And I had to be home every night at five, so I got a job as a daytime dishwasher in a brand new French restaurant that had just opened in downtown Minneapolis across from the gleaming office building where all the ad agencies were. Yeah. And I thought, okay, that restaurant will be open for a while because at least lunches will be busy, yeah. right? I, I knew enough. And one day, one of the cooks who ran the grill station, uh, which got hammered at lunch, didn't show up. And they were trying to find someone to fill in, but the, the restaurant was only like two weeks old. And I'd been washing dishes and watching the food, and it was French bistro food, and you know, it wasn't hard. And uh, so I went up to the chef and I said, I can put out that guy's station. And the chef was like, you know, go back to the, yeah. the dish pit. Like you know, the halfway the dish house pit. dishwasher is going to handle and, this? This uh, could be a bear, scene from the bear. I was like, okay. And as they got more desperate, I said, look, I wouldn't say I could do it if I couldn't do it. I don't want to let you down. And something about my look persuaded him. So I put out the lunch station and I sort of bailed them out of an expediting kerfuffle or two. And um, 
the, you know, and I had worked in Michelin starred restaurants in Europe, in Hong Kong, at the best restaurants in America. I'd worked with, I mean, I'd spent 14 years um, working in New York City and Los Angeles in the best restaurants in America. And I had been in Europe and the Far East. And so I, <laughs> I, it was simple. It was bistro food. Grill the salmon, put the onion soup right. under the broiler, steak free, drop the fries, you know, grill the shrimp for the, the special. I mean, it wasn't that that difficult. Make the rat tattooey. And um, the owner of the restaurant afterwards, you know, crooked his finger and said, can you tell me why my dishwasher just put out the best looking food I've ever seen in Minnesota? And I was like, well, I, I said, that's a bit of a stretch. He goes, no. I just watched my dishwasher step into the kitchen and run it. And I, I sort of had to out myself. And he said, well, can you work? I said, I have to, I can't leave before seven and I have to be home by five. I'm living in a halfway house. Uh, the day I got out of the halfway house, he fired everybody, made me the chef. And I rehired staff from all the different treatment centers and halfway houses in the Twin Cities because some incredible culinarians have some amazing substance abuse problems. And I put together basically an all-star team of uh, second chance restaurant people, really mm -hmm. talented ones from Florida, uh, California, New York. There's a place like this in Baltimore too. I Chicago. And uh, it, was, it was glorious. And so for many years, we were the best restaurant in town. Uh, but something was, something was missing inside of me. I was, I, I was treating work differently than I was the rest of my life. And so my gurus in my 12 step program suggested, I try to figure out a way to live all of my life on one page. And so that meant, meant to me leaving. And so I tried to create a TV show uh, that would suit my talents. And so the idea was in a world where we were judging each other by, you know, who we who we fell in love with, the color of our skin, the language we spoke, the music we listened to, the God we prayed to, if one at all. Um, why don't we focus on our on the things we have in common? And let's tell that story through food because, the, yeah, and my hook was food that other people aren't talking about, right? Because at the time on Food Network is, was here's how to saute a chicken breast. I want to talk about people eating iguana or kasumarzu, the famous, you know, maggot cheese of Sardinia, right? Um, and they, uh, they went, for, I mean, long story short, they went for it. And the, the, the rest is kind of history. Well, it's not history. Yeah. The, they bought a couple shows. It didn't do so great in the ratings. The third episode came on and a shaman that I had hired on a lunch break to perform an exorcism on me. Not that I felt I needed one, but I just thought it was interesting. And yeah, Matt, three... Matt Schlapp also tried an exorcism recently, <laughs> I saw. I don't, it didn't work for him. I don't know, maybe work it worked better for worked you. Worked for me. I went on to have my best year in life ever. <laughs> uh, but um, I, we were on a lunch break. There was a three person crew, me, a videographer who did sound mm -hmm. and our producer writer. And uh, the three of us would, would write the show and edit, do everything at night in our hotel room. And, uh, you know, because we got no money from Travel Channel. And uh, I went and had this exorcism and I persuaded our videographer to film it because I thought once I heard what was going to go on, which was just horrific, he's going to spit on me, he's going to light me on fire, he's going to kill little animals by beating them against my chest. I mean, this he's going to beat me with branches. I ended up breaking out in welts all over. It was a poisonous branch. And um, it, it was pretty horrific, went on for like three hours. Well, they cut it down and they made it a part of the show. And so the third week when our ratings were, I mean, it was heading south. Uh, I got a call from the bookers at the Tonight Show and they said, Jay saw a clip of your show because the, the talent bookers saw it and they want you out in LA tomorrow night to do the, the Leno show. And I said, sure. And I went out there and Jay loved me. And like that classic thing with Johnny Carson in the comics, he said, we love you, will you come back? And I said, sure. Well, the ratings the next week were through the roof and it sort of never stopped. So if it wasn't for Jay Leno, I, I don't shaman, think really. I would be talking. Um, but along the way I, I did, I mean, the, the most valuable pieces of advice I've ever heard came you know, from people who helped me get my, 
act together and help me, you know, become a human being. Uh, I didn't need to be rehabilitated. I needed to be habilitated. I mean, I was a, I was a fucking mess. And um, so, you know, th this idea of being able to sit in a room and have the, the confidence to look at everyone else and say, I don't know how to do that. Can someone show me or can you help me? Uh, was a new muscle that I was exercising. It took me 20 years to use it every day. I now use it every day pretty effortlessly. If I don't know something, I'll admit it. That took 20 years. I've been sober 32 years. So that means it wasn't until I was 50 that I was able to look someone in the eye and say, I don't know how to do that. Can you help me? And that's so powerful. I, I believe it's a sign of strength, not of weakness to ask that question. And I, it's, it's probably the most valuable thing I ever learned because I try to tell it to, you know, young people, my son, uh, you know, I try to tell that to him all the time. You don't need to pretend about something. It's okay not to, not to know something, you know, everyone doesn't know more than what they know. So uh, I think if, if I had to pick one thing, uh, that's it. And I, and I guess that's one A, one B would be, um, there should be someone in your life who knows everything. There should be someone. I think the secret to, to sobriety, to all of these different 12 step groups, self help. I mean, there's so many different good things for good people to recover from all kinds of yeah. different isms, not just my isms, but you know, the ones we all have, um, they all have one thing in common. And that is that sort of confessional aspect where there is someone who hears the whole story. And th there's different things that happen in different groups after that. But I believe the power is actually that we compartmentalize our lives. So whether that is, and even from our loved ones, even from our kids, yeah. our, our spouses, our, I mean, our, our bosses, our, sometimes even our best friends, because we're so embarrassed. Sometimes it's easier with a stranger. For sure. um, and I do know people who, are, who do not go to church, who walk into uh, a Catholic church and seek confessional for this very reason, because it's easier to dump it on a stranger. Yeah. But once I got into the habit of doing that, and I now do it every year and it's part of my recovery. Um, I think telling someone everything, the good, the bad, the ugly and everything in between has a spiritual power that I think is impossible to claim anywhere else. So for, yeah, for that's, that's, I really think those one A and B are good. And that resonates with me. One, see, the other thing you said that resonates with me, and this is why, you know, people very rarely come out of the closet and also to their best friend. I came out of the, I, I came out of the closet to somebody I barely liked actually. Right. Cause it's like safer, you know, you can say it, um, that way. And, um, and I, once I did, and well, I said it was the best decision I ever made because so much other good stuff in my life has come from it. I, I still, you know, when you said living your life on one page, like this is the thing when I was writing about kind of my, you know, where I went wrong and like how I got, you know, too deep with, with the Republican stuff and the Apo research stuff. I was thinking that I, I made this change in one part of my life that was so good and so life affirming. And I had all this stuff going right, you know, and I was no longer lying. And I was, you know, like a lot of other traits about myself. But in my work life, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't synthesize them. You know, I didn't, I didn't do, I kept one part of my life going the same because I was like, well, things are going fine in this, in my career. I don't need to change this. And, and finally synthesizing that became, was so big for me. So that, that really resonates with me, the one page uh, analogy. It, it's, it's interesting you say that because uh, my parents divorced when I was four or five years old in 1965 into 66. And uh, my father had fallen in love with a man. And they uh, lived together from 65 until 2015 when my father passed, when they passed away uh, within eight months of each other. Wow. And so my entire life, because my memory is limited before I was six, right. um, I had two dads. And as I grew older, you know, I, I grew up in New York. I knew exactly what was going on. Didn't matter. My dad was my dad. My stepdad, Andre, was the best parent out of all the three. You know, I mean, <laughs> truly. Um, and it wasn't until about three years before he died in his 80s that my father, my wife was freaking out. Well, my, now my ex-wife, but my wife was freaking out because my dad had come to visit and had told my wife that he was coming out to me. 
And I, I want, I looked at my wife and I was like, I've known my whole life that my dad is gay. What does it matter? Does it? And she's like, this is about him. This is about right. him telling you the word. He's never told you his story. And that resonated with me because I realized my dad waited until he was 80 to live his life. And he really actually never did. My I grew up in a Cajo Fole household. My stepdad was very flamboyant. Very He was very Nathan Lane. My, <laughs> my dad was, you know, uh, you know, fought in the Pacific for three years during the height of World War II, started this big company in New York City in the 50s. I mean, he was just this massive, larger than life hero. And he was the guy that took off his wedding ring when Maine finally had their Marriage Equality Act passed and they got married. I insisted. They weren't going to, but I was like, look, legally, one of you is going to get in the hospital and I can't take care of you unless you're married. So you're right. getting married, right? And they were very grateful that I sort of pushed on that, but my dad would take off his wedding ring when he went shopping because he didn't want people asking questions. That was the generation that he was in, but he needed to sit in the car with me and come out to me so that he could tell me his story, which was hysterical because on troop carriers in the, in the, uh, in the 1940s in the Pacific, my dad would tell me, you're down there for 72 hours. I could have gotten a lot of tail but I didn't because I was conflicted. And I mean, hearing hearing this 83 year old Jewish giant to me, this like, but he was so hysterical. It was a, he still had one foot in the late twenties, early thirties when he grew up and one foot in 2012 when he was telling me this story because he wanted to make his life whole. And luckily by the time he passed, he did, but you, you, you're right. Until we get everything on one page, as human beings, we can't be happy. Yeah. Well, big changes for you at 50 and him at 80. That's really, that's inspiring, actually. That's a good takeaway that people can make positive life changes then. Okay. Uh, we could do that. We could do two out. We could probably do two days on that, really. But um, uh, we need to, you know, it's a political podcast, ostensibly. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, uh well, first, like we have to, I have a couple specific issues I want to get into to with you. But we have this: the farm bills coming up. This used to be like a totally non-controversial, like the, it's, it was the last thing standing that was not, you know, all wrapped up in our stupid culture war. Um, I think that is ending um, for a variety of reasons. But I, I, what I wanted to ask you, just in the biggest possible picture, if we made you like you know, the sultan of ag policy, you know, Joe Biden just bestowed upon you the powers to put whatever you wanted into the farm bill. Like what, what are some big picture food and ag policies that you think would make the biggest positive impact? Well, I think there's a handful. Uh, I mean, you know, with something that big and unwieldy and, and I'm not saying the question's too big or, or yeah, I sure. reject it quite the opposite. I, I, I embrace it. But there's, I give a stump speech of, of my own that I've, I've told at South by Southwest, a bunch of other places that, about these sort of 14 pillars. It's kind of like a Mobius strip, actually. If you want to get involved in a client, in climate crisis work, if you hop in on that issue, you get you will get involved with hunger and food waste. You will get involved with immigration reform. You will get involved in national security, international security, economic development. You You can't help. But and that's just six of the 14 pillars, right? There are a lot of other ones that are that are so intertwined and they a lot of them overlap inside our our what we call the farm bill. It really should be the food bill. Um, and I think that's where I'd start. Um, if if the if I was in the Oval Office and he said, you have you have a magic car, drive it. First thing I would do is establish a cabinet position uh, for food. Um, it represents over 20%, over 28%, depending on how you calculate it with other aspects of the hospitality industry, ag, and all the rest of that. But if you take our entire food system, everything, every single piece it goes from pizza and bowling alleys to giant farm to freighter farms, you know, that ship out of Corpus Christi, Texas, um, it's about 20% of GDP. Um, that's massive. So we have something that represents 20% of GDP and not a single agency with one person to report to in charge of it. I think that's a criminal negligent situation. Hmm. Um, uh, so that's number one. I would put it all under one house, right? We just have too many organizations, yeah. too many places that everything sits. So that's number one. 
Second thing that I would do is I would take the farm bill and I would evaporate it, okay? You can't have one giant piece of legislation that has a tiny little piece in it that gives money to family farms who are producing specialty foods, which is what the government calls foods fit for human consumption. Yeah, everything besides uh, corn and sugar and wheat. One, that's right, in one corner. And in the other corner has a near trillion dollars by now. I mean, I think the last time I checked it was, well, I shouldn't say near, it's about $800 billion, but that's pretty darn close to a trillion. Uh, but $800 billion, I think is what SNAP is uh, right now. Um, you know, SNAP actually puts money into our uh, economy. Uh, that's not a left or right issue. That's just a, a plain old, you know, American fact. It's one of the few social programs we have paid for by taxpayers uh, that uh, is net net positive. So I think we need to we would need to broaden SNAP. And, and the other reason is, is that the, the, the poor and the hungry keep getting poorer and hungrier. And one of the few things that work is SNAP. And I would enlarge its purview, not just making it easier to, uh, to join, but I would want to make sure that, you know, every year we dribble and drab, oh, you can buy potatoes and onions with it now. Yeah. We, we should just allow people to make it buy food. Aren't you a little so, concerned about 300 pound women buying fudge rounds? With no. it, that's a, that's a. I think there's a lot of that, concerns about the, that recently. Well, that's the retort. Uh, that's a very common. That's a common retort. Uh, well, look at who's going to abuse it. I don't think we have a system in America that someone isn't trying to abuse. I would I would argue if I was testifying in front of a congressional panel that the panel itself, in in, in feeling that way, is doing exactly that of which they are accusing. Um, I think the first thing we need to do is broaden the lane and then take care of those that are sort of coloring outside the lines. They're, we're never going to do away with bad actors yeah. with any sort of public policy uh, program, and especially anything that involves money, which is about every single one of them. Um, but those are the, those are the first two things uh, on day one that I would do. And I think the next thing that I would do is I would have to address the American food supply chain. Um, and that is something that is extremely damaged that I think we saw during times uh, in recent past, uh, especially during COVID, um, how flimsy, in a sense, that, su that supply chain is. Uh, and I didn't think you'd go there. So go to tell me more. What, what do we well, need to do? Affected by global, it's affected by global circumstance. But when you yeah. shut, when you kind of shut the world down, you realized uh, how uh, less self-sufficient we were, right? Well, sure, um, we saw this with Ukraine, too. and the, yeah. Everywhere. We've seen, I mean, we see it today all over. The, the problem that we saw during COVID was really one of preparedness, right? Um, in other words, we're, we grow enough food to feed everyone, right? Mm -hmm. And I want to get back to that because that would be the third thing I do is make sure that we eliminate, we can statistically eliminate hunger, but I don't want to get distracted by that. It would only cost $17 billion a year. I guess I'm distracting myself from it. But the, the, we, we famously on the cover of the New York Times, there were two incredible pictures. One was the San Antonio Food Bank picture, which is uh, where I had volunteered uh, in the past, an incredible group of human beings down there. And they showed this line snaking mm -hmm. through right uh on week three and it revealed to america saying really interesting because people said wait that's a volvo station wagon wait that's a bmw why are these people right because the american system allowed it easier for people to get credit to get a nice car while they were struggling to put food on the table right. and did that mean that maybe those families made a choice they maybe shouldn't have no because when they when they got that car things were fine it just showed how they did, it's kind of like shows how fragile we are between the the yes i can afford it line and the no we're in trouble and we have to i know it's a cliche decide between grandma's medicine or food for junior and his sister right and uh the other picture which i found even more impactful because this says so much about our american farming system crisis is it was a it was a picture of a farm in immokalee florida and i remember it because again i had visited that farm making television and it was a mountain of zucchini and lettuce that looked like a Minnesota snowbank, you know, you know, in March. I mean, it was a hundred feet tall and a hundred feet wide. 
and people were staggered. How can all those that zucchini and lettuce just be rotting in the parking lot of this farm? And it's because the, the truckers couldn't get there to get it. There weren't enough truckers. It just, people don't understand. You know, we make that joke about, you know, the, the, the young girl that goes on a school trip to the supermarket and the teacher says, oh, there's milk. And she says, I knew it didn't come from cows. It comes from boxes, right? And it's, it's amazing how many of my contemporaries, neighbors, I mean, walking the dog during COVID, you know, in April across, 2020 across the street, how are you doing? Do you have everything? And shouting questions at me because they saw me, you know, at, at that point every morning I was on MSNBC doing my sort of reportage there uh, on the food crisis. Um, how flimsy and how, uh, how dangerously precarious a position our food system was in. The, uh, it took about three and a half, four weeks for us to re-establish supply chain routes so that what was coming out of the ground actually got to the market so that those gaping holes yeah. where there was supposed to be bread or supposed to be zucchini, there was bread and zucchini, right? But for a long time, there wasn't. And the fact that, uh, you know, that was the only time that we started to see front page news about uh, meat factory workers, how dangerous the job is, and the presidential order that our 45th president put in there to make sure those people uh, went to work, um, and the value of food workers in general. Um, people really didn't understand that it was, that it was other people who put food on their plates. Now those other people, a very large percentage of them are illegal. Uh, okay, now illegal. we're getting into a big area of agreement. And so so we used to uh, give out uh, tens of millions of visas, specialty ones, short-term ones, visas of all types. Um, and the numbers would just confuse people, but just trust me, visas yeah. of all types so that we could have both permanent and temporary workers come into this country, do work, the vast majority of which all went back home when the season was over because they made a lot of money here. During that time that they were here, they paid taxes. It's taken out right. of their paycheck. Right. Didn't matter if they wrote down that, you know, they were Andrew Zimmer and, and they lived in Minneapolis, right? Uh, it's payroll it's, tax. It, the taxes get taken out, right? Um, they spent money while they were here on food and lodging other things when they weren't taken care of by the company or the people that were, were pulling them up, up here. That sort of stuff leads to really dangerous working conditions. It has kept food prices artificially low so that they can maintain an artificially low standard all the way through the system. So it, it not only does it increase the need for immigration reform, it also would have ultimately led to one of the biggest problems we have today in restaurant culture. And I love to dine out. I know that you're a big fan of food and restaurants. It's why our chicken breast meal has stayed at 14 to $18 on restaurants all across America, even in fancy tablecloth restaurants, because they're afraid to raise the prices. There's an artificial, I mean, other than the Jewish deli where it's supersized and everyone says, I only eat half and I take the other half home. You can't raise a price on a menu in America without half of your consumer uh, base wanting to walk out saying, why'd you raise the pasta buck? It's like, well, because we make it from scratch and we're trying to take care of our employees. Um, well, I, think this is, other... I, I want to pause here for a second, though, and talk, because the connection on the economic side, right? I, I mean, there is the human rights side of the immigration yep. side of this thing, right? And, and the fact that we should treat pe these people with dignity. And and that we haven't for we didn't for a long time and we especially don't now and now we're not and now, you know, we're really stuck in a very bad place with what's happening on the border. But but there's also the economic side of this. So you're talking about how it artificially kept prices down and, and there's something to that. But there also is something to the fact that it's a big reason why like grocery prices are up right now like and so and so this is like a huge problem i think for joe biden and i think one of the areas that i i just think that has been a failure for, of his um is 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 t is being too worried about demagogic right-wing attacks on immigration stuff not changing not changing 
you know, reincorporating some of these visa programs, some of these temporary worker programs. And so instead, now we don't like, like the best thing we could do for inflation, like we don't have enough workers. There's not enough, you know, people immediately think about people picking the fruit, the but it's, it's everywhere, everywhere there aren't you, enough you workers. Couldn't be, you couldn't be more right. And, I, and I've said this to groups, this is one of the great political failures of the last 60 years, six zero. It is, this is, the, Democrats and Republicans have held that that office for long. No one has addressed immigration reform, and we need it desperately for a, a gazillion reasons. One of the many important ones, I would argue maybe top 10 or 12, is food cost in America. Um, for folks that don't know, uh, the, the number of visas has shrunk so much that crab companies on the Chesapeake Bay that used to get 40, 50 visas a year are now getting 20. So they literally can't produce as much crab. Now, this affects it's tourism. so stupid. This affects it's just unbelievably crab. stupid. It's, it's nuts. And in What's Eating America, I remember looking at a woman who'd been coming to this one crab company in the Chesapeake Bay for 28 years. And I said, tell me what it's done for your family. And she grabbed this. She reached behind her. She grabs this picture. We didn't stage it. And she holds it up and and you can see three very clean cut, successful looking kids all in their late 20s. One's in the military getup. She says, this is my eldest son. He's a colonel in the Mexican Air Force. Uh, this is my uh, second child, my other son, a lawyer. And this is my daughter. She's in her final year of med school in Guadalajara. She says, I put them through school and raised them as a single mother on the money I made here. And I paid taxes and those are my kids there. And she looks right down the barrel at me and says, if more people were able to do that in Mexico, kids wouldn't be turning to drugs and crime. And, the, and it really Storming is- Storming the border, true. right? Like it, it, really it ties to the rush at the border. That's right. When I look as traveling around the world as a globalist, and I've circled this planet more times than I care to count, and I've been- in every non-aligned country that there is except North Korea. I've, I've spent a lot of time in countries talking to a lot of important people about this issue. The, the, when people have jobs and when they have food, they don't look elsewhere to supply those things in their life. And it is the more that we create disaffected people around the world, we, we suffer from international, potential international crises of a security type because we are creating the type of anger around the world that we could easily solve as a global leader. Um, I mentioned before, we can statistically eliminate hunger in America. The figure is about $17 billion a year, but we could start to extrapolate, which by the way is a rounding error when it comes to our annual federal yeah, budget, sure. right? I think it's 0 0.0027. At least it was like eight, nine months ago when I when I did the math and talked about it at a teaching teachers convention in Texas. We 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 live in a world that is so interconnected that the degree to which we help people, right? And I saw this in Zambia just last April when I was over there with the World Food Program. Um, you know. Then there's then there aren't signs, you know, that says the People's Republic of China is building this school, right? I want that sign to say the United States of America is yeah. building this school. Yes. When I was in 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 high school traveling the world with my dad, he took me around the world a bunch of times. He would point out all the roads that had signs that say this road is being built by the United States of America in far flung corners of the world where he would take me. And and he held up his then gray colored sooty green gray colored passport and says that's why this is the most important passport in the world and now you know i'm not sure my blue passport carries the same kind of value we we need to be doing those good works we can start by modeling that in our own country and export that kind of wisdom out into the world yeah and i also think conservatives should be proud of uh, anyway we could rant about this i mean just the idea that 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 retrenching is going to be the answer to this, right? And that we're going to be able to somehow like create some alligator moat on the border and people that are having problems elsewhere aren't going to try to come here and figure out solutions. Like it's just all nonsense. And I just, I'm imploring Democrats. I understand 
there's a political fear that that the right wing will demagogue about this right and that like you you don't want to be seen as too pro immigrant right you might turn off some what blue collar voters that are people i under I, I do understand that but there is a way to say we can have a secure system we can have a secure border system but we also need 40 green cards for crabbers not 20. i mean like i like, guess it's great like it's crazy and there's that you can do that for lobster you can do that for every industry right it, i mean I, we could go on and on tim i can't tell you what a little bit of honesty would do if it, remember when you just talk about the 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 sheer amount of money in our food systems of all yeah. kinds in the hospitality industry and everywhere food touches like hotels and resorts and it, everywhere um that that the president of the united states doesn't get on tv and says says i'm about to announce something that some of you might may regard as controversial but let me explain it to you because i think it's very easily explained if there are people in salvador and guatemala places that i've been yeah. in the last yeah five, six years. So I'm no stranger to those countries or, or to the rest of Central America, quite honestly. Um, and you say, we will have less people at our borders if we put programs in place that allow more guest visas, that allow more opportunity for them to get jobs here. By the way, jobs that no one else in this country will take. We interviewed farmer after, I'm talking about when I say farmer with a capital F, we're growing 10,000 acres of strawberries. We're the Driscoll people. Yeah, right. The Driscoll people said, we've never had a person. This was an amazing thing from this woman. She said, we've never had a person who looked like you show up for any of our jobs that we've offered ever. Obviously. And when she said, look like you, she didn't mean adorable old bald guy with glasses, <laughs> right? And it, I, I was, I knew that inside. But to have the farm, she says, I've been with this company for 20 years. Yeah. We've never had a, we need, we, we're, we're literally tilling lettuce under the soil because we don't have enough people to pull it out of there. At the same time that we have 22%, you know, food insecurity stats here in America. And that it, that's true for children as well. And we can't pull the lettuce and the vegetables out of the ground. I'm like, oh my God. Gosh. While we're ranting about this, can I add one other thing that the president could say on this or that any politician could say? Like, think about the 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 just first world problem complaints that people have right now about this economy that you hear from people in your life. Oh, I go to my local restaurant and, you know, I don't get the same service that I used to get. Or I, I saw a tweet today, like at the hotel, there weren't the, the, the restaurant isn't open anymore. You know, after, you know, we're not getting room service Living anymore. No, like all these hassles, all these prices, box. more guest workers solve all of those problems. So we can just give you your creature comforts. Like there's a practical argument to that. There you see people aren't coming to rape your children that they're right. coming to do, take these jobs that are annoying you that they aren't filled anyway we all agree we're having a heated agreement i want to talk about climate really quick yep uh my husband was a was in the in the fake meat business for a while and so <clears throat> i have a couple questions about that there, there was a moment like i felt like a a fake meat moment in 2018 or 19 or something where everybody's like, this is it. This is going to happen. The impossible burger, the beyond burger, we're going to get rid of the other burgers and people are dressed and all the restaurants had them. And like that moment feels very past. Now all the mm -hmm. media coverage about the fake meat is, is, is terrible. I, like what, what happened? Is the, did this meet some practical thing? Did it get wrapped up in culture war stuff? Was that not as good as that? Like, where are we going on that? The alternative meat side of things. I think we'll get back there because it is the answer. Um, we can't feed our planet without using a little bit of everything. Wild, farmed, and that's that's with meat and fish, cell-based, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The largest growing sector of food in America is the uh, is plant-based foods. Uh, over the last five years, it's up 44%. Um, I spent all morning today talking to six different congressional uh, offices about um, uh, about this very issue. And um, the problem is is really, really deep. But I think the problem that you brought up about what happened, you use the word media in there. Our media in 2023 is now so pervasive and comes in so many forms that it can what's the term on uh on social media oh it can trend yeah like that 
And so fake meat trended for several years because it's all everyone wanted to talk about. We were giving, no pun intended, fresh meat to the hungry media lion. Mm. And the media lion ran with it. Now, what happened later on is we realized, okay, this doesn't have great texture. This doesn't have great taste. This is too expensive. And in the case of cell-based uh, fish, cell-based poultry, all the rest of that, which, by the way, is actually the answer, is too expensive. You think cell-based rather than plant-based is the answer? You're making that distinction? Uh, well, I just think long-term, like 100 years from now, uh, we will be actually creating cell-based chicken that where we didn't have to kill an animal, where it tastes just like chicken. And so a vegetarian, unless they have digestive issues, would eat that product, right? A lot of vegetarians come to vegetarianism uh, simply over the morality issue yeah, right. of it or how the animals are raised. I, I'm taking nothing away from people who just choose to only eat sure. vegetables for other reasons um, because of the destructive nature internally to their system of animal proteins. Okay, no problem. Yeah. We'll have plant-based stuff too. But I do think that the, the fact that it takes so much energy, especially water, uh, to make a lot of these products, and it can only be done in small amounts, the, the excitement withered away. Um, uh, Josh Tetrick, who owns the company Just, uh, is someone who I've made TV with for 20 years. He's a friend of mine. Uh, we, 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 we've known each other a long time. And, uh, you know, he uh, famously sent some of their uh, uh, cell-based chicken and Jose Andres is famously serving it in one of his restaurants. And I texted him and I said, oh my gosh, I said, I'm going to be in DC in a couple of months. And Jose is one of my closest friends. And I, I said, I'm definitely going in to try it. He goes, he goes, oh my gosh, because we're only able to give them 10, 12 portions uh, a week. And he said, let me know the next time you're out our way and I'll make sure that we, you know, you can come into the store. And I was like the fifth person in the world to eat a plant-based egg. Sure. When that first rolled out, he was the first one to do it 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, it, I, I ultimately think it will obviously be a mix of both, but I think cell-based will make more people happy because if you're like me and you're a meat eater, you like that texture and you like that smell of what the Maillard reaction when real protein not protein made from peas and lentils. Real protein hits the griddle and gets a char on it. There's, you can't replace that. So I do think that once the costs come in and whether that's, look, the plant-based people, uh, sorry, the cell-based people tell me, oh, that's right around the corner. Then other experts say to me, we're 50 years away. So I take all of that with a grain of salt and say, so, well, whenever that time comes, it'll be okay. But I, I see that as further down the road. Plant-based stuff, and, and here, is, here is something that I hope happens. I'm all for plant-based anything. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a capitalist. I believe capitalism will save us in the energy sector and the food sector, to name two. All right. uh, the healthcare sector, I'm, my jury is out on because I, the, the, the abuse in there is just mind-boggling to me we're three um, for three on agreement there so yeah moving but on. the, the I, I do see the other two sectors being corrected by capitalism because there's too much money to be made there and i do know because i'm intimate with the the situation and you know uh congressman mcgovern just introduced legislation called the plants act uh, a couple of weeks ago that is going to hopefully get usda dollars 50 billion over the last 25 years has been given by the USDA to prop up the meat industry, the real meat industry, mm -hmm. by investing in companies, loans, you know, insurance programs, all the rest of that kind of stuff. And we've only given 50 million to farmers who create. I mean, this is this crazy. This is really. This is already going to be one of my, my final questions. It's crazy. Like the it's, like it's even crazy. the IRA, the amount of money that goes to the energy side of climate versus ag, it's like a thousand it's to one, ten thousand to one. Why? Let's just get people to eat more vegetables. Like I'm all for a plant based burger, but I'm also for like grilling up a whole bunch of vegetables and putting them on a bun. It's delicious. You know, hello, Spain and Italy. Everyone who's making an impossible burger is racing to Portugal and asking me to help them get reservations. Yeah. So, um, okay. Well, final follow-up question on this, and we'll get to rapid fire. It's a, it's a, it's a two-part. One, 
uh, is so are you telling me that my uh plant-based meat food stocks are going to turn back around because they're really not doing that well and number two i'm very yes. skeptical yes okay great uh your lips to god's ears um you know to Toulouse needs to pay for college um so you've got to uh my i'm skeptical um of that and here's why i, I just I, maybe i'm too wrapped up in the politics but I, I don't know, man. I think that the, that food is so deeply culturally, uh, you know, it hits people like right where you know on on their passions. And I think that the the plant based meat and the fake meat industry and a lot of it didn't like we're we're a little sanguine about that about like you're, you're what right. is going to happen and that it's going to take a long time to win people that who aren't like me who don't feel that way about cows. You're, you're or whatever right. Over. Yeah, you're right. But you're describing all the people you know and yeah. all the people I know, all right. the people you hang out with and all the people that I hang out with. Right. I know that we could get those groups together and have a great dinner party because it sounds like they really love food, regardless of what kind or what type. And they understand the connection people make over a meal, sitting down somewhere and just enjoying that time and that that stuff together. The, the the thing is, I'm here to tell you as someone who's who's just been down there in the trenches, whether it's making my shows like family dinner and I'm and I'm by the way, this is not a plug. It's just oh, that wow. in the making of TV over the last 25 years, both with bizarre foods and driven by food, my all my overseas shows, but then all my shows in small town America, like family dinner or food truck tip or all those other shows that I made, I've gotten to spend a lot of time in small town America. And there's a lot of people in small town America with a grandma that made everything from scratch and they love food too. It's just a different kind of food. And no, they've never been to, you know, a Michelin starred sushi bar, but they love food as much as someone who only goes to Michelin starred sushi bars, right? However, 35% of America is like, I don't care, just pass the mustard. It doesn't matter to me, it's fuel. This is just what I need to keep going. No, I don't think when my idea of enjoying food is a bag of chips and a diet Coke in the afternoon when I get home from work, right? Yep. And that's not to put them down. It's just to say that it's not everyone has the same romantic relationship to food that all the food magazines or the people on television like me sometimes like to, although I'd like to think I'm more truthful than others. Yeah. They, there, a lot of times I turn on food television and people say, why don't you like that show? And it's like, because they're selling, you know, the emperor has no clothes. Not everyone has a house on Nantucket and a pile of 30 lobsters and a golden retriever that's perfectly shorn. And that's the centerfold of all those food magazines. Now, I should say, all the big food magazines have stopped doing that. But people like myself, I think, were the first to complain and say, that centerfold is not America. That's a tenth of 1%. If that, do you know how much that house on Nantucket costs? So I, I think more people than not would be eager to get a source of protein that is something that's healthy and inexpensive and feeds their family. That is a great place to uh, end the extended portion of our of our podcast. We're doing rapid fire really quick. Are you ready for rapid fire before I let you go? You're busy. You're Never busy been dude. so ready for anything in my whole okay, life. Okay, food related rapid fire. Usually we have some politics rapid fire, but for this one, I just we did a lot of politics. So let's just go food only. Okay, um, sure. where do I want to start? Okay, I'm, I assume that you like that that having a cooking show is kind of like being in politics, where everybody. Uh, comes up to you and wants to talk to you about that, which is fine. It is what it is. Um, but uh, I assume you get from everyone this question I'm about to get, which is, I'd love to cook more. I like cooking, but I'm really busy and I got kids and I got a job and whatever. So your one sentence piece of advice on, on getting into cooking more for people like me who are ordering from DoorDash too often. Uh, click uh, on three or four recipes that you like online or cut them out of a magazine and cook them all on Sunday and store them. Cook them all on Sunday and store Whatever them in your, your fridge or in your freezer. Oracle Sunday, in your, right? Whatever your day yeah. is, I, I store cook, them in your fridge or in your freezer. Your fridge. fridge. Well, freezer if you if you care to parse it up. When I make spaghetti sauce, I make two gallons and yeah. put them in eight quarts in the freezer. Hmm. Smartest thing I ever did was spend one hundred and fifty dollars and get a scratch and dent freezer to store my stuff. Cook once, eat many times, but you can reduce that down to the week, right? So if you're gonna make 
salad dressing, make two or three and just put them in half quart containers. So you're just chopping vegetables and putting homemade dressing on. I mean, stuff like that. Just just cook once, eat many times during the week. Your food's going to be great. That's good advice. I'm glad I asked that question. Okay. Best tasting, can't miss bizarre food from your whole bizarre food era. But give me, don't give me something like I've got to travel to the remote village of Ecuador to try it. Like, give me something uh, I could actually get. Uh, well, I was about to say tiny fried baby birds because that is my favorite. That sounds but amazing. It, I believe it's illegal in this country. Mm -hmm. um, it shouldn't be, but I believe I believe it is. Um, I think the be the 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 food that no one wants to try at least in my house, and I make it from scratch and love it, is uh, is blood sausage. Um, and I make it with rice and I stuff it into my own case and I use the the Northern Spanish style, which means I put some sweet spices in there, some nutmeg mm. um, and a little bit of clove and a lot of caramelized onion. And I serve it with sauteed apples and mustard and sweet and sour red cabbage. And it's I'm about to get into that part of the season in about a month. And everyone at my house, is devouring the first link like this is the greatest combination my and it's so beautiful and it's delicious what is this and i'm like it's blood sausage <laughs> um favorite sleeper food city then you mentioned that where if you want to go somewhere and have an, a culinary experience and you know don't do the obvious well i mentioned one. i mentioned it before and i and, and and i really don't didn't mean it as a joke you know portugal is the country that's having its moment yeah. right now and lisbon is one of the world's great food capitals it's not as broad or as deep as some of the other food capitals, but you'll eat as well in Lisbon as in any country on planet Earth or any city on planet Earth. And in America, I would probably give the nod right now to the city I'm coming from, which is Minneapolis. Um, of all of that group of second and third tier cities, I mean, Portland, Maine had its moment. It still does. Portland, Oregon still does. Uh, four or five years ago, I said it was Birmingham. Uh, it's now Minneapolis. People are mm. actually coming here for a weekend. And part of the reason is the incredible restaurants and food scene that has sprung up here. Okay, finally, it's a it's New Orleans themed. I just moved here in April. So I have a, a three parter for you. Your favorite Creole or Cajun dish. Uh, I want to start cooking Creole or Cajun food. So what is one dish that you would start cooking if you were me that, that isn't too challenging? And, you know, a favorite New Orleans restaurant or thought about our culinary culture here? Um, well, let me start out by rejecting the question. Um, Please. God, that's of course you're New right. Orleans, New Orleans is the only, only, and anyone who's listening to this who wants to fight me, have at it. I'll meet you in the backyard is the only city in the world when I say the name New Orleans and you hear it, you can actually taste it in your mouth. And it doesn't matter if you visited there once or you live there. It is the only city in the world. You can smell the And room. you can smell it. You can taste the chilies. I mean, like just talking to you now, mm -hmm. I'm smelling it. There is more good food in that city. I mean, I mean, what? There's 100,000 people live there and 60 million people go through there a year. The restaurant scene there for a small city is is the most vibrant that exists because they're feeding out of towners and yeah. they're they're not selling you. Yeah, there's great Indian and Chinese restaurants there and I'm not trying to just but they have their food, right? And it's morphed. So there is New Orleans Italian food which is different than Italian it's food so anywhere else in America. It's its own Thing. I mean, just go to two jocks and tell me differently. Um, I happen to love the classic old sort of diner style Cajun Creole hybrid restaurant that's best represented uh, by a restaurant about 20 minutes out of town. I think it's in technically in Metairie uh, okay. called R and O's. And this is okay. going to kill me because now people are going to flock there and I'll never be able to get in. But R and O's may be one of those restaurants where I happily have my last meal I, I feel there, like I'm now I'm going there on Sunday so I'll I tell him you like sent me on on Saturday Night Live this restaurant has everything <laughs> sassy waitresses long tables sharing with other people every dish on the menu tastes great seafood like you've never had it before you don't know why other places charge so much when for like $25 which is very little for this you get a platter either 
fried, steamed, or grilled of 10 different types of seafood and remoulade and mustard sauce on the side. And a lady who says, who just doesn't ask, just puts another sweet tea down on the table next to you and also puts the check down and say, we're too busy for you to have dessert. I mean, you have to love the, and then when you pay, she brings you like a hand pie, which was what you wanted anyway to walk out the door with. Um, it's a, our nose is a mind boggler. And in terms of cooking out of it, I, I think one of the greatest chefs of his or any other generation and an incredible entrepreneur and owns some of my favorite restaurants in town is a gentleman named Donald Link, L-I-N-K. Mm -hmm. um, he has Peche Seafood yeah, Grill, yeah. he has Herb Saint, he has a lot of very well-known restaurants there. A really good friend of mine. I've spent a lot of time eating there with his family. I've gone up to Rain, Louisiana. He's he's Cajun by birth. So I've gone up and, and picked rice with his family, gone frog gigging with his family, cooked with all his brothers. Um, so get any book of his and start because it's great. And one of the best dishes that I think is is available in the in the Cajun Creole repertoire is something that's a little more Cajun than Creole. Um, and it's really, you could do it with any seafood, but it's blank in sauce piquant. And sauce piquant, you start with a little flour and oil to make a light roux, throw in some peppers and onions and garlic, and you can make it spicy or not spicy, but it should be a little bit spicy, and some stock, and you cook it down and you smother a sauteed or grilled piece of fish or crab or frog or mm -hmm or even chicken, yeah, but that's kind of boring, in it. And that's a sort of classic and simple and a weeknight dinner in any house in Cajun country. Um, and if you do it with crawfish and put it over dirty rice, you have something that's as quintessentially uh, Louisianan as anything else. Uh, there's nothing I would rather do than eat in the city of New Orleans. Man, I'm getting hungry. I was planning on getting sushi tonight, but now I might have to drive up to Mattery. I don't know. I'm going to send you a I, selfie from Mattery whenever I, I'm there. I'll, I'll tell you right now, yeah. whenever you go to R&O's and I, you know, and, you know, full confessional, it's not like we don't know each other. You will text me and it will be two words. You'll say you understand. Three words. You undersold it. <laughs> I I would I would hope that that is true, and I will be sending that to you soon. I've, I've gone and a little bit talking over. Talking about food, not politics. I am I'm literally the Pope of food. Of course, I'm right. Of course, you're right. Of course, you're right. But I want to I want to taste it to believe it, if you will. Yeah, you'll love it. I wanted you'll love to give it. you a chance to rant about politics. I, look, we got to do this again, maybe next year or something. An election Happy. themed one. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate the time. I uh, hope to see you next time you're through town and, uh, and vice so. versa. I hope so. Take it easy, my friend.